In August of 1492, faced with the choice of conversion to Christianity or expulsion, 200,000 Jews fled the Iberian Peninsula. Here's what happened to them. Initially, around 100,000 Jews fled to the Kingdom of Portugal, which had not much earlier been at war with the Spanish crown. However, this refuge was short-lived. In December 1496, in order to secure a marriage to the eldest daughter of the Spanish monarchs Fernando and Isabel, King Manuel I of Portugal issued his own edict of expulsion, requiring all Jews to convert or leave the country within the next 11 months. However, within a matter of weeks, Manuel changed the edict, instead prohibiting Jews from leaving the country and forcing them to convert no matter what. For this reason, they're not actually included in my overall count of refugees, but their story is far from over. At this time, the lands of the Spanish crown also included the island of Sicily, which had been home to a large and prosperous Jewish population for centuries. Sicily's Jews mostly fled to the neighboring kingdom of Naples, but when Naples fell under Spanish control in 1504, the Jews were once again forced to flee north. Although Rome had a venerable Jewish community, these new refugees were not welcome in the Papal States. Venice, which was not incidentally at war with the Pope, amended its laws to allow Jews to become permanent residents, but it also confined them to the undesirable district of ironworks known as the Ghetto, from which we get the term ghetto. Ultimately, fewer than a thousand Jews resettled there. The majority either settled in the Republic of Florence or left Italy entirely. Additionally, over the same period, Jews were expelled from Navarre, France, again, and Nuremberg, resulting in the worst refugee crisis in European history up to that point. Altogether, out of some 240,000 refugees, 150,000 were resettled in the rapidly expanding Ottoman Empire, largely thanks to a coordinated rescue effort by Sultan Bayezid II. Here, Jews could enjoy the same level of freedom that they had enjoyed during the Sephardic Golden Age centuries earlier, and as much as they were enjoying in Poland, but with better weather. For his efforts, Sultan Bayezid II was celebrated as a modern Cyrus the Great, but he was only the first. Between late 1516 and early 1517, Bayezid's son Selim I absolutely steamrolled the Mamluk Sultanate, taking control over Egypt, the Levant, and the Hejaz. With that, the Ottomans controlled not only the extremely valuable spice trade, but the holiest sites in both Islam and Judaism. Selim's son and successor, Suleiman the Magnificent, was proclaimed the new caliph of the Muslim faith, and quickly set to work rebuilding Palestine. On the one hand, part of this rebuilding included permanently sealing the Golden Gate so the Jewish Messiah could never enter Jerusalem through it. But on the other hand, an integral part of that rebuilding process was resettling Sephardic refugees in Palestine. Since the end of the Crusades, there had been a trickle of Jewish immigration to Palestine, but under the ruling Mamluks, anti-Jewish violence and government policies had steadily increased, culminating in 1442 with a series of deadly riots and the imposition of a number of European-style laws restricting Jewish employment and dress. When the Mamluks finally fell, Palestine's Jewish population was no larger than it had been 200 years earlier. After Suleiman's conquest, it doubled in a single generation. It was still nowhere near the community of 50,000 that had been there before the Crusades, let alone the two million of ancient times. Many decades later, the Jewish Duke of Naxos, tossed by Suleiman with undertaking this resettlement program, would consider the effort a failure. But while Palestine may not have been fully Judaized, the 16th century unquestionably saw it restored as the epicenter of Jewish study and thought. But not Jerusalem. Nor any of the other holy cities, nor even one of the major ports. Jews did resettle in those places, in large numbers, but strange as it might sound, the most popular destination, the new center of the Jewish world, was a place you've probably never heard of. Perched at the southeastern edge of the Upper Galilean Highlands, Safed had been a sizable but fairly innocuous city in the days of ancient Judea. Josephus mentions it as one of the cities he had fortified during the First Jewish-Roman War, though no actual fighting took place there. After the Bar Kokhba revolt, when the great Sanhedrin relocated to the Galilee, nearby Mount Meron became a popular burial place for its members. Shimon bar Yochai is the most famous, but he was far from alone. And over time, 
These graves became shrines for pilgrimages, as was mentioned by Benjamin of Tudela on his journey in the 12th century. Safed itself had risen to prominence during the Crusades, with its high position over the Jordan Valley making it a valuable lookout spot for enemy troop movements. When the Crusaders were driven out, Safed's castle was the only one that the Mamluks didn't abandon. In fact, they expanded it. At the same time, malaria, which had previously come through the region in waves, had become a permanent fixture in the Jordan Valley, leading low-lying Tiberias to decline while Safed, way above the Mosquito Line, took its place as the Eastern Galilee's main city. However, this heavy Mamluk investment in Safed also made it an unusually fierce source of resistance against the Ottoman conquest. Shortly after Suleiman's invasion, a pro-Mamluk uprising targeted the city's Jewish minority, who were seen as overly favorable towards their conquerors. But as part of Suleiman's rebuilding of Palestine's infrastructure, the city was reinforced with walls and an Ottoman garrison, and over the next 50 years, Safed's Jewish minority became the majority outnumbering even the Jews of Jerusalem. In 1538, after an arduous decades-long journey across North Africa, a Spanish-born rabbi named Yaakov Berab arrived in Safed, soon becoming the city's chief rabbi. Finding himself surrounded by the greatest concentration of Jewish minds in a single city since the days of the Talmud, Berab saw no reason not to take up the mantle of the ancients and revive the great Sanhedrin, the governing body of all Judaism. That effort failed, but he did succeed in reviving the ancient ritual of ordaining rabbis known as smicha, which he first bestowed on four disciples, Moshe Ditrani, Moshe Alshich, Yosef Sagis, and Yosef Karo. These five rabbis would form the beginning of the hotbed of Jewish scholarship known as the Safed Circle. Though it was their students, the first generation of great rabbis born after the wave of expulsions, who would propel the city to greatness. Moshe Cordovero was probably born in Safed, but his early life is hopelessly entangled with legends cooked up by his students. It's sometimes claimed that he was one of the founding members of the Safed Circle, despite having been 14 at the time. His name wasn't even Cordovero. It was Cordoero, rope maker, pretty far from the grandeur of Golden Age Cordoba. Cordovero, that's the name posterity has given him, I just have to go with it, popularized the practice of meditation by way of walkabout. Wandering in the forest of the Upper Galilee for weeks at a time, in order to remove distractions and ponder the mysteries of Kabbalah. Basically, shower thoughts. The idea wasn't to stop thinking, but to allow one's mind to wander. Cordovero's two main works, Pardes Rimonim and Tomer Dvora, aren't very well remembered today, but they were hugely important for systematizing Kabbalah into a coherent discipline, reconciling early forms of the practice with that laid out in the Zohar, as well as using Kabbalah to analyze non-mystic concepts like ethics. They also established Kabbalah, rather than the lofty constitutionalism envisioned by Yaakov Berab, as the dominant mode of Jewish study for most of the early modern period. But why? Why Kabbalah, and why now? Well, before the Holocaust, the Alhambra Decree was the defining modern tragedy of the Jewish people. A huge percentage of the world's Jewish population, while not killed, was in a sense lost. And now its survivors, those who had left the peninsula, were everywhere. You didn't have to look long in any Jewish community on the Mediterranean to find them. One big reaction to that tragedy was the growing belief that the Messianic Age was imminent, provoking the deep dive into mysticism in which the Safed Circle came to specialize. But the face of that movement would not be Moshe Cordovero. From the moment he was born, Yitzchak Luria was basically the poster child for the new Jew of the 16th century, a native of Palestine born to an Ashkenazi father and a Sephardic mother. Orphaned at a young age, he was taken in by a wealthy uncle in Egypt. But instead of taking over his uncle's work as a tax collector, Luria used his family inheritance to take Kabbalistic meditation to a whole other level, disappearing to a cabin on the Nile for years seeing his family only on Shabbat, and speaking as little as possible, and only in Hebrew. Finally, in 1569, Luria moved with his family to Safed, meeting Moshe Cordovero just before his death the following year. But although they only met face to face for a short time, Luria knew Cordovero, and in the old master's absence, Luria would complete the systematization of Kabbalah. Now, to reiterate my disclosure from a previous video, 
I am not qualified to study Kabbalah, so I apologize in advance for not getting all of this. But in my defense, my lack of qualification is kinda Luria's fault. It was Luria who first separated his students into novices and initiates, reserving the most difficult and esoteric subjects to those who had proven themselves capable of understanding them, and perhaps more importantly, not misusing them. So I'm gonna tread lightly. If you've ever seen the Yosher, the arrangement of the ten sfirot into three columns with 22 connecting threads indicating pathways to the En Sof, that was Luria. If you've heard that Jews don't believe that the Garden of Eden was a literal place on earth, that was Luria. If you've ever heard that Judaism is open to the possibility of reincarnation, it was Luria who turned that idea from a vague speculative notion into a coherent theological concept. Those are just the things I can summarize in one sentence. And by the way, he did all of this and more in the space of three years, dying at the age of 38 in 1572 and setting off a century-long craze for young rabbinic prodigies in Palestine. A year after his death, Luria's teaching notes were collected by his top student, Chaim Vital, and published as the Etz Chaim, which has been the instruction manual for students of Kabbalah ever since. Despite all of this, there was still a Jewish world that existed outside the realms of mysticism and meditation. There were still Jewish courts that needed to make rulings, and the Alamber Decree had created a problem for those courts that had never really existed before. For centuries, Sephardic Judaism had led the world. When medieval Jews fled England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, the vast majority sought refuge in Spain. Sephardic rabbis had been the best educated and the most respected, and Sephardic courts set precedents that came to be adopted across most of the Jewish world. But that acceptance was not universal, and with Sephardic refugees now scattered across Jewish communities in huge numbers, often outnumbering the Jews already living in those places, it was no longer clear whose law was the law of the land. Maimonides, the greatest of all the Sephardic rabbis, had claimed that his Mishneh Torah was the only book on Jewish law other than the Torah itself that any Jew would need. But as beloved as Maimonides might have been, many of his rulings in the Mishneh Torah were never widely accepted. Even if they had been, almost four centuries had passed since the Mishneh Torah's publication. Legal interpretation had evolved. History had moved on. Jewish law was never supposed to be set in stone. Until 1565. Despite the reverence that still existed for Maimonides, his Mishneh Torah had long since fallen out of popularity in favor of the 14th century Arbaturim, a four-part compendium which offered multiple interpretations of Jewish law and excised many laws which had ceased being relevant, like the commandment to shun the Moabites, or the instructions for performing a sacrifice at the temple. In the 1550s, one of the founding members of the Safed Circle, Rabbi Yosef Karo, wrote Bet Yosef, Nominally a commentary on the Arba Turim, the Bet Yosef really just used that book as a jumping off point to explore how consensus interpretations of Jewish law had evolved over time. However, only after publishing the Bet Yosef in 1559 did Karo discover, while researching for future projects and reading fan mail, that there was a wealth of Jewish legal history that he had somehow missed. I could never imagine what that's like. But instead of printing a second edition with an appendix explaining what he left out, like every other author in the world, Karo just rewrote the entire thing, not only adding in the extra research, but documenting his own research process as part of the text, which was then edited and compiled by his top students, sent off to Venice for publication, and released in 1665 as the Shulchan Aruch, or Set Table. Karo hoped that, by pulling back the curtain in this way, he could help rabbinic students hone their own legal reasoning skills through a deeper understanding of the movements that influenced those who came before them. Instead, the Shulchan Aruch was adopted almost universally as the definitive code of Jewish law. In the short term, this solved the problem of conflicting local jurisdictions brought about by the Sephardic refugee crisis. In the long term, it broke Judaism. By adopting the Shulchan Aruch as a universal code of Jewish law, it created the precedent that no future ruling could ever, literally ever, contradict it. This was how Judaism became Orthodox Judaism. But there was a little bit more to it. Over the previous two centuries, 
the Jewish population of Northern Europe had rebounded from the Black Death at a truly astonishing rate. I'll go more deeply into this in a future video, but contrary to John Green, this was not the result of a large influx of Sephardic refugees into Poland or the Holy Roman Empire. And there's no better evidence of that than the fact that most rabbis in the North, while generally accepting of the Shulchan Aruch, were dissatisfied with its omission of Minagim, traditions specific to certain schools or regions of Judaism, but which have no actual basis in Jewish law. Considering how complex Jewish law already is, you may be surprised to learn that many of the most famous Jewish traditions you might have heard of are actually Minagim, like the Ashkenazi superstition against naming a child after a living person, whether or not it's acceptable to eat rice during Passover, or the uniquely American myth that you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery with a tattoo. Some of these minagim date all the way back to the Second Temple period, like the debate over whether a synagogue should be oriented towards Jerusalem using its entrance or the Ark containing the Torah scrolls. For most of the Middle Ages, many of the same disagreements over minhag had existed within both Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities. But since Ashkenazi Jews had been nearly wiped out by the Black Death and the accompanying massacres, a much greater uniformity of tradition had emerged in Northern Europe. And to reflect this, the chief rabbi of Krakow, Moises Isolis, composed the Mapa, or tablecloth, to interpolate the rulings of the Shulchan Aruch with details on the Ashkenazi Minag. Or at least Isolis' interpretation of the Ashkenazi Minag. His writing was widely criticized at the time for being too Krakow-centric. But like the Shulchan Aruch itself, the Mapa was a hit and in so doing, created a formal break between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Judaism. In a time of chaos, people wanted to know what they were supposed to do. These works fulfilled that need, albeit at a great cost that we're still living with today. And it all happened because of the great men of Safed. So what happened? If you're watching this in the present day, and now that I think about it, how could you do otherwise, you know that Palestine didn't remain the unrivaled capital of Jewish thought and culture for more than a single century. But if all the greatest minds were in Safed, and all their students came out of Safed, what changed? Well, remember at the beginning of this episode when I mentioned that the Jews of Portugal were forced to convert? See, even though the Jewish population of the Iberian Peninsula was officially zero at this point, Jewish immigrants kept coming from there emerging from hiding after generations carrying on in secret. They had not been around for the Safed Circle, or the Shulchan Aruch. Maimonides had advertised the Mishneh Torah as the only book on Judaism that anyone would ever need. What if it was the only book you had? Special thanks to my patrons, including my Nevi'im. Eric Atreides, Jeremy Biskind, Osha Gordon, and James Majors.